Welcome everyone. The HIPRC Education and Training Corps is pleased to present today's event, Writing for Dissemination. For over 30 years, HIPRC has conducted rigorous research in the areas of injury prevention, injury care, and public health consequences of violence. HIPRC is also a leader in interdisciplinary, socially diverse, and inclusive training of public health professionals. HIPRC, HIPRC has trained over 140 injury control researchers, most who work in academic settings. Today, we have over 100 participants, 59 participants from the University of Washington from various ranks and departments. We also welcome 45 participants who have joined us from other organizations and backgrounds and even other countries. Danielle, if you could please go over the group norms and participation rules, thank you. Thanks, Christine. Um, so here are our group norms. I won't read the whole thing. I'll just read the words in bold. Benefit of the doubt, safe place, step up, step back, acknowledge, give and receive feedback. And here's our audience participation tools. Uh, please utilize the reactions button to provide your feedback. Um, if you would like to indicate that you want to speak, please raise your hand. Uh, you can put type in your questions in the chat box and I will help moderate your questions throughout the presentation. Uh, I will also be putting in a link to our evaluation and feedback form for the event. So please be on the look for that link in the chat box as well. And now, Amy, can you please introduce Dr. Rivara? Thanks, Danielle. Today we have Dr. Frederick Rivara. He is the Seattle Children's Guild um, Endowed Chair. Um, as you see here, he's also um, Vice Chair and Professor for the Department of Pediatrics and Adjunct Professor for Epidemiology. But I think what we're here today for is Dr. Rivara founded HIPRC in 1985 and since then has contributed to mentoring and contributions in the field of injury prevention for this project he's also on the line um can we have you guys introduction and then we'll move on to project thank you thank you um and over the last 30 years dr rivara has um really acted as a mentor and a guide for so many um, interacting with over 130 scientists at various stages um, in their research and careers from summer student programs to former fellowships. He won the National Award for Mentoring, and most recently he was awarded the W. St. Jim Junior Leadership Award by the Federation of Pediatric Organization, the highest for a pediatrician. Please welcome Dr. Fred Rivara. Okay, everybody can see that. So thanks very much. Um, I've been editor of journals now for about the last um, 21 years. Um, please everybody mute um, your microphones. Um, I've been editor for the last 21 years, 17 years as um, the editor of JAMA Pediatrics and now for the last few years, editor of JAMA Network Open. So uh, having been editor for a long time, going to talk with you about writing and, and getting published and hopefully um, help you be more successful in that. Um, I think it's gonna be hard for anybody to see if you raise your hand, but please put a question to just, just say you have a question and um, into chat and we can take those questions as we go along. I think that's, um, I don't necessarily want people to hold their questions to the very end. If you have a question, let me know. Uh, Dr. Rivara, people are saying that they see presenter view. Is there any way to do the full screen? Um, that's what I thought I had done. Um, let's see, there we go. There you go, thank you. 
Okay, how's that? All right, so today we'll talk about um, selecting a correct journal, um, talking about the cover letter, structure of an article, um, what happens when papers get to a journal, how they're processed, um, how you should respond to review a comment and some other um, suggestions. I do want to point you to this one resource, the Equator Network, which is a very nice um, source for checklists on different types of articles. And most journals require a checklist for randomized controlled trials, but they also have checklists for a bunch of other kinds of articles and they can help you um, write more effectively. So the first is, is, the, is this a correct journal? So you want to make sure that your paper is a good match for the journal in which you intend to submit it. And um, it's important to actually look at the journals and look at the articles in those journals and make sure that your article is a good fit. And journals have different kinds of types of papers they prefer. So I write primarily for a medical journal, and that's what I edit. But if you submit a paper, for example, to a social, um, a social medicine journal or a social science journal or a psychology journal, they have very different requirements. They usually require much longer um, introductions, much longer discussions. Um, they like their statistics to be presented in a certain way. So you really need to look at the journal and um, make sure that your article is a good fit for that journal. It's worth shooting high, but um, you know, be realistic. You know, New England Journal of Medicine with an impact factor of 79, you know, accepts like 1% of papers um, submitted to them. So your, face, your first research article is unlikely to get submitted, accepted to the New England Journal of Medicine. And um, many of these journals will have quick turnaround times, but you know, be, 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 shoot high, but also be realistic. The last bullet point here about Jane um, is a very nice website that you can put your abstract, you can paste your abstract into it, and then it will show you journals that have published similar kinds of, of work. So it can really help you in terms of choosing which journal to submit your article. Now, believe it or not, we have instructions to the authors that are meant to help you. And unfortunately, many people don't read the instructions to the authors. So please read them and, and look at them because they'll help you be more successful in getting an article accepted to a journal. They will tell you the kinds of articles that they're interested in. They'll tell you the word count that, that um, and, the, and the length of an article that they're interested in. They'll also um, tell you um, what they want in terms of figures and, and references and supplemental material. You can email an editor and ask them whether they're interested in an article. I get probably two or three of these a day. Um, and you know, I try to respond right away to them the same day. And if I um, really feel the article is is just of no interest, I'll say that. If the article might be of interest, I'll well say yes, it's of interest and submit it. But it's important to realize that there's no guarantees. If the editor says yes, I'm interested, submit it. That's by no means a guarantee. The only thing it probably is a guarantee of is that the editor will um, will send it out for review. If you do have a communication with the editor, do note that um, in the cover letter and oftentimes in the, in the submission form that journalists have, they'll say, have you had previous contact with the editor? Um, make sure your clinical trials are registered before you recruit patients. So really for the last 10 years or more, all randomized clinical trials where, or, or clinical trials where the um, researcher controls who gets an intervention versus who doesn't are required to be registered. Now, the reason for this was that there were lots of pharmaceutical studies that um, were being conducted and those in which the results panned out negative, we never knew about. And so that led to a lot of a wasted research effort that we never knew about, as well as then people most likely um, duplicating those same efforts because they didn't know that this study had been done and it was negative. And when you do meta-analyses, if you're biased to just having the positive study, um, 
then you're going to have a bias meta analysis. So you have to register your, your papers. The most common one that's used is um, clinical trials like Gov. And I urge you to do that. You, you need to do it before you recruit patients, before you start recruiting patients. Um, and it's, what's in, also important in that is they'll ask you, what are your primary and secondary outcomes? And be careful when you list those, because the journals are then going to look back at clinical trials like Gov and see what you list as your primary outcome. And does that match up to the primary outcome that you have now reported in your paper? So it's important to do. But it's also important to do appropriately and well. The cover letter, um, don't spend a huge amount of time on it. To be honest, um, I and a lot of editors don't look at these very often. Um, so, you know, most journals require you to have one, fine, but don't spend more than a half an hour on it. Um, and make sure you address the person correctly. So here you can see a paper going to JAMA and they said consideration for publication Lancet. So they obviously sent this paper first to Lancet, got rejected, and now they're just not even bothering to revise the cover letter and are submitting the same cover letter to another journal. So, you know, if you're gonna write one, make sure that it's a, a appropriate cover letter and that you don't sort of shoot yourself in the foot with a cover letter that's incorrect. So let's talk about the structure of an article and we'll go through each of these things. And this is the standard structure for a typical research article, introduction methods, uh, results and discussion. And you know, before you sit out to write the article, you should sit down and think about what are the two or three important points that you wanna make in it? What is the story that you wanna tell in this research article? And those important points are gonna be emphasized the results section of the abstract, the conclusion of the abstract should reflect those points. And it's what's emphasized and highlighted in the tables and is the first paragraph of your conclusion. So you really need to have that in your mind before you even start writing the article. And that, you know, it's sometimes people overreach and, and try to have too much in an article. Um, and so you really need to think through what's the, what are the two or three important points you wanna convey with that? There's more than two or three important points, then you probably need to, to cut out some and slim it down. Otherwise your article is gonna to be too diffuse. The title is important. You know, we all do PubMed searches and PubMed searches are partly based upon the title as well as what's in the abstract. Um, but if you have a title that's non-descriptive, then it's gonna be hard for a um, PubMed search to turn it up. And this is particularly critical if you have a research letter where there's no abstract um, and PubMed just bases, bases it on the, the title. Don't make the title cute. No, don't do that. People like to do that a lot. And I always ask them to change the title. Don't make the title declarative. Um, one of the, my mentees who's on the call um, had a paper which I looked at this morning, the title was declarative. She said, this is associated with that. Well, that's a declarative title where you're telling the results of the, of the um, study. You wanna talk more about you know, association of X with Y, not that there is an association. If you have a randomized control trial or meta-analysis for systematic review, please do include that in the title. Those are, are important to help your article be uh, picked up more and, and cited more often. Secondly, you know, when you do PubMed search, you have to get into past the title, you look at the abstract. And, and most people only read the abstract, whether it be in a journal or doing a PubMed search. And you really want to make sure the abstract is a informative, correct abstract. Most journals now require an abstract to be structured. They give you the contents that they want in it, like objective, um, patient population, um, methods, um, the analysis methods, the results, and the conclusions. It has to be concise, so it has to be well-written, but you don't want it to be concise by having a ton of abbreviations in it. Um, I sometimes get these and you know you quickly lose track of what these 10 abbreviations and the abstract all mean. And that's a real turnoff to, to readers, to reviewers, to editors. So keep the abbreviations to a minimum. Now, if it's like a common abbreviation, that's fine, like Glasgow Coma Score GCS. But if it's an abbreviation that you made up, then it 
it can be really hard to keep track of those kinds of things. Um, you want to have data in your abstract. You want to have results, and that means you have to have numbers. You don't want to have a dataless abstract. And the conclusions have to follow from the data. They can't be conclusions that then are a leap of faith. Um, you know that that have really that may be something you're thinking about, but are not based upon the data. For example, reporting the incidence of obesity in a particular patient population that may be the subject of your of your article but then you can't conclude that we should do this kind of obesity intervention program that's not what your article is about your article is just reporting the incidence of obesity so your conclusions have to really follow from the data and here's an example of dataless abstract so I'll, I'll let you to quickly read it, but you can see that there really aren't any data in it. It sort of says what they found, but it doesn't really give you data to judge for yourself uh, what they found. So you want to have numbers in your abstract, and obviously not all the numbers, but the key numbers in there. All right, so that's a title and the abstract, next comes the introduction. Again, for most biomedical journals, like I, like I um, edit, the introduction should be relatively short, no more than two pages, and oftentimes it can be less than that, um, type pages. It should be focused. Now, evoking higher authority means like, say there was a National Academy of Sciences report that says this is a need and your article addresses that need. Well, putting that in there, that the National Academy of Sciences said we need X, that justifies um, to some degree why your study is important. This is not a doctoral dissertation. And so we don't wanna have 50 references just for the introduction. They should be key references and references as I've mentioned later should be, unless they're classics, um, studies in the last five years. Most introductions can be shorter. And then criticize with care. Well, why is that important? A, you may or may not be correct. The B is that the people you criticize may be the people that I ask to be reviewers on your paper. And frankly, nobody wants to be criticized harshly. And so if you criticize a reviewer harshly in the introduction, um, that's gonna be <laughs> sort of stack the cards against you when that reviewer looks at the rest of your paper. And if you, if you criticize that per per person inappropriately or incorrectly, that's really gonna stack the odds against you. So here's an example of a um, paper that was published in, in JAMA. You can see title is pretty straightforward. It's not declarative, it just says looking at the effects of, of steroids uh, versus um, without antibiotics on acute sore throat. Then it has the um, words, a randomized clinical trial. So it's a really nice um, title of a paper that tells you what the whole article is about. And here's the introduction. You can see this first paragraph um, provides you information, general introduction to the topic, why is it important? The second paragraph brings in the idea of steroids and symptomatic relief. And the third paragraph um, really says quite clearly, this is the, um, here's the research question. This is the objective. And it looks at single dose of dexamethasone versus placebo. And does it increase the resolution of symptoms after 24 hours? So it's a nice straightforward three paragraph introduction. Um, you know, it has what, 12, 13 um, references in it. So it really kind of exemplifies what I was talking about. Here's one that Peter Cummings and I wrote a number of years ago, and this is the whole introduction. It's two sentences. Um, obviously this was super concise. This was a jam, a brief report, which I think was 1800 words, um, but we didn't waste a lot of words on the introduction, but we sort of said, here's the problem. And then here's the study that we're gonna do to um, address the problem. Uh, before I go on to methods, um, Danielle, are there any questions that were relevant at this point? No questions right now, Dr. Okay. Navarro. All right. 
So the methods are, are clearly important um, because it's the, it, the methods, you know, both in basic science and here in, in clinical science um, should be such that a, a researcher reading it knows what you did and could actually reproduce the same experiment, the same study, knowing from your methods. The methods can be fairly complicated. And so oftentimes you have subheadings for different parts of the methods. The study population is important for clinical research. Uh, how were the subjects selected? What were the inclusion and exclusion criteria? Um, and you always wanna make sure in your paper that all the numbers add up. And this can be a problem sometimes when you revise the paper and you forget to revise the abstract or forget to re re um, revise all the tables and figures. You always wanna make sure that when you finally push that submit button to a journal, that all the numbers add up and you have the right versions of each of these components of the paper. IRB approval or equivalent um, should be mentioned or a statement to say that it's not necessary. I already mentioned trial registration. Now, methods can sometimes get long, can get complicated. And so you can put more detail on the web in an online supplement. And most journals will have an online supplement. However, it's important to realize that most people, most readers don't look at those supplements. Even in a place like JAMA, the rate of people looking at supplements is about 2%. So, you know, I as an editor would say, well, put stuff in an online supplement. But you have to realize that most people don't look at that. So writing the results. Um, when I write a paper, I usually start with the tables and figures and then write the results section to tell the story that I, uh, that I am illustrating with the tables and the figures. Um, it should follow directly from the method. You don't want to, you don't want to introduce new results into the result section that have not been discussed, how you got to them in the methods. And as a nice way of doing things, having the order of presentation of the results parallel the order of presentation of the methods. And again, if a paper is, is more complicated, you can use section headings for each of the different sections in the, in the um, results. You know, discussions or sections are something that oftentimes are a little bit more difficult for people to, to write. Um, I think if you try to use this formula here, it'll be a lot easier for you. So the first paragraph should be a statement of the principal findings. Either the second paragraph or the next to last paragraph should be strengths and weaknesses of the study. There's always weaknesses and limitations of the studies. And what you want to do in that is section, in that paragraph is point out what you think are the major strengths and then anticipate that you know the limitations as well as anyone to your study and try to address them up front so that the reader and reviewer can say, okay, there is those limitations, but th this is how they've dealt with it, or this is why I don't think it really affects the validity of the paper. And then you want to put your study into context of other studies. How does it um, support prior work in this area? How is it different? Why is it different than other work? How does it advance the field? And that's one or two paragraphs. And then um, what's the meaning of the study? What are the possible mechanisms for a particular finding? And what are the implications of the study for your readers, whether they be clinicians or policymakers or other individuals? And then you might want to have unanswered questions and future research. Now, I think it's important to go easy on the last two and, and not to, um, for example, speculate too much on mechanisms here. If you really don't know the mechanisms, fine. You don't know the mechanism. No one knows the mechanism, that's fine. Um, be careful about speculating on a mechanism that may or may not be true. Tables are, are clearly important because they help to summarize complex data. And for the most part, I like tables more than figures. Now, a lot of people like figures because they're easy to look at and um, easy to grasp what's going on. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes it's not. Sometimes that you, if you have a table, for example, um, that shows odd ratios, uh, you know, it may be hard for me to figure out exactly what's the point estimate, what's the 95% what's the confidence in that figure. And it may be better presented in a table. 
Also remember that most journals will have a limit to the number of tables and figures that you can have together. So in the JAMA network journals, it's five total tables plus figures. Um, so you don't want to use a figure, for example, to show here's the distribution by age or here's the distribution by, by gender. That could be half a sentence in your results section. You don't even need to have that in, in a figure. Um, in tables, um, make sure the numbers, the columns and rows add up. Make sure the numbers add up. Make sure there are not um, typographical errors in, in something. Um, you know, we all make typographical errors typing something up and you just need to go back and look at it. And then just, you know, after a day, go back and just look at the tables and say, huh, does this make sense or there's something that's strikingly wrong here? Um, but you wanna make sure the columns and rows add up. And if they don't add up, maybe it's a good reason they don't add up. Or it could be that you did a typographical error in there. As I said earlier, make sure you use the right version and um, that it matches your text and the abstract. Figures and tables should be self-explanatory. So you should be able to look at a table or a figure and understand the message that it's conveying without having to necessarily go back and read the text that accompanies it. Your figure your titles and the legend should be able to explain what exactly um, is, the, is going on in that table or figure. If you have lengthy tables or figures, consider splitting them into two or deleting redundant elements. References, um, I think you all should use reference software. Um, it just makes life easier for you. There's, most universities have these for free, um, but they can be used They're mostly web-based nowadays. And it just makes life easier um, writing and certainly when revising something. So use a reference software. Citation should be no more than five years old for the most part, except if it's a, um, if it's a classic paper that you wanna put. But I see all the time papers that use citations from you know the 1990s or early 2000s. And that's probably, um, you know, that's dated and you, you want to have citations that are much more up to date than that. Make sure your references are correct. Um, you know, the, this is a common problem where they're not totally correct. And, and the reason why this is important when you submit your paper, because, you know, the, the, the copy editors actually goes through and looks up each of those references to make sure they're correct. And they're going to say, oh, this is wrong. And then you have to go back and make sure it's correct to begin with. Um, let's see, any questions? Somebody's having breathing here <laughs> in the chat, in the um, Zoom. A brevity is a virtue. The New England Journal has a limit of 2,700 words. Um, in JAMA journals, they're usually 3,000 or 3,500 words. And if you get, if you submit a paper that's 4,000 words and say, even in the cover letter, I can't make it any shorter, well, I'll do two things, either I'll reject it or I'll send it back to you and say, you need to make it shorter. Um, so don't, don't um, even if it's a qualitative paper, don't make your paper long. It, it makes it difficult to read for the reviewers. The editors don't wanna see, see that. Um, and it, it can and should be shorter. And just to give you some examples here. So Watson and Crick, their 1953 nature paper that won them the Nobel prize was one page long one page. When Lincoln went to Gettysburg and gave his address, there were two speakers that day. First was Edward Everett. He gave a speech that was 13,000 words long. Lincoln got up and gave the Gettysburg address of 268 words. Guess which one is remembered? So brevity is a virtue. You know, it's the old story. That Mark Twain says, if I had more time, I'd write you a shorter letter. It's easier to write something that's long and it takes work to make sure it's, it's concise and brief. Okay, any questions so far? We'll, we'll get now to the kind of reviewing process, but any questions so far on the structure of the paper? Uh, no questions in the chat, but some um, comments. Dr. Maliha said, so simply explained, loving it. Dr. Rivar is the only author that I had read always as a young researcher when I started writing my first proposal for thesis on injuries. Okay, thank you. Um, 
So here's what happens when you submit a article to Gemini Network, but it's pretty much the same at all journals. So it goes into triage editor and um, we get Gemini Network open. I get about a thousand papers a month right now. And myself, my deputy editor, Steve Finn, actually look at every one of those. And we decide which ones we're gonna reject without review and which ones we're gonna pass on to one of our 12 associate editors. When it goes to an associate editor, they can also reject it without review, or they decide, yes, this is worth sending out for review. And then they assign two to five peer reviewers. How do we select peer reviewers? Well, we have a database that lists peer reviewers, but we also look at the references that you have in your bibliography that are relevant. And I don't basically look at any references more than five years old because I don't know whether those individuals are at the same institution they were five years ago. So you wanna use the most up-to-date references. Now, some journals will ask you to suggest um, peer reviewers. Um, and that's good if they do, but give it some thought. You don't wanna ever um, suggest a peer review who's at your same institution or somebody that's on a current grant with you. It should be, you know, be fair to, to yourself and the journal and suggest a peer reviewer who's at another institution who you think we're gonna give you a, a nice unbiased review. Um, and then once the, once the peer reviews come back, um, we talk about these at our manuscript meeting. We have manuscript meeting calls twice a week. Um, and we decide whether to proceed with them to get a staff review or not. And then basically to ask whether it should be revised or rejected at that point. If it's revised, um, we then send you back the comments, um, ask you for revision, and then it comes back to us after, after that. Now, some journals will send their revised papers out for a re-review. Um, I've been working with a journal, I'll say the name of it, Brain Injury most recently. They've done it four times to a colleague of mine. Uh, and it's ridiculous that they keep on sending it back for re-review, re-review, re-review. For the most part, I think good journals do not do that except maybe send it out for a statistical review again. But usually it's the editor's um, job to make the decision on that. So why do um, papers get rejected without review? Well, there are lots of reasons. Um, it could be the wrong journal. That's why I mentioned at the very beginning, it's important to look at the journal and does this match the journal? It might be formatted terribly. Um, Data are too old to be relevant. I know at JAMA, um, they don't look at papers more than five years old. Now, you know, for my journals, I will look at papers more than five years old, but if it's a paper having to do with the prevalence of a disease problem, I won't look at it then because the prevalence, if it's like 12 years ago, or 10 years ago, or eight years ago, the prevalence might be very different now than it was eight years ago. And therefore the paper is really not terribly useful. Most of us don't really wanna know what the prevalence of a disease was eight years ago. They wanna know what the prevalence of the disease is right now. It's not novel. So yesterday I looked this up. As of yesterday, there are 132,211 papers published on COVID. So you've gotta have a really new idea and new data to get a to be able to make a significant contribution to COVID. We get on the order of about two to 300 papers a month related to COVID. And initially they were all interesting and exciting. Now they're mostly repeats of the same thing. You get papers, for example, showing that um, obesity is a risk factor for serious illness or death in COVID, or that um, poor people and, and Blacks and Hispanics have higher rates of, of COVID than whites, all important all important information, but the information that's probably been reported many, many times. So is your paper novel or new? If it's not, well, then it may get rejected because of that. Similar paper recently published. Um, that's why it's important to read the journal. Now, it also could be that I recently accepted a paper that's not yet published. You won't know that, but that'd be a reason why I might also reject it. If it's poorly written, poorly designed, um, wrong analysis, that may be a reason to reject it. Sometimes, you know, if we feel like the question has merit and the paper is salvageable, that's fine. Um, we discussed a paper yesterday where they basically used the wrong control group, and that's not a salvageable paper. So that one would get rejected without review. Conclusions are too sweeping. Case reports. Um, 
I also serve on my department as the vice chair for academic affairs. So I sit on our department's promotions committee. And I can tell you for faculty scientists, case reports don't count. They might count for people in a clinician track, but for faculty scientists, they don't count. And so don't spend time for the most part writing case reports. Um, already mentioned this here, and most journals would have papers undergo statistical review. It's important to realize that reviewers are just making a recommendation to the editor. And the editor considers a lot of other things in addition to what the reviewers consider. The reviewers want to look at the importance of the paper, the design analysis, um, but they just make recommendations to the editor. You know, two or three times a week, I get letters asking for me to reconsider um, my decision. And they say, well, the reviews were really positive. Why did you reject my paper? Most of the time, I don't reconsider because I've thought about the paper carefully already. Um, and what, they, what the authors may not realize is that A, the reviewers are just um, making recommendations. And B, there's lots of other things that we take into consideration besides the quality of that one particular paper. Balance of different kinds of papers, what's our acceptance rate, um, that sorts of things. And then also that the reviewers will provide confidential comments um, to the editors that the authors don't see. So they might be fairly praiseworthy to in the comments to the authors, but they might say to the editor, you should never publish this paper. I already mentioned this, we review the paper, get statistical help and make recommendation. But these are probably the two most important things that we're really gonna talk about is the validity of the paper and its importance. Is this an important topic and is it valid? Now, if you get to the point where you're asked to um, revise and resubmit a paper, that's great. And many journals, the um, acceptance rate after you revise and resubmit may be 80%, or even sometimes higher. It's not 100%, so you can't be guaranteed that you are gonna get it accepted but your chances now are much higher than when you first submitted it. So that's good. But the task is for you to answer and respond in an appropriate way. You want to um, answer completely. You don't want to skip comments. Um, and you have to sort of start from the premise that most of the time the reviewer and the editors are correct. And if your approach is to argue with the reviewer and the editor about 80% of the points that they were making, we're just gonna reject that paper. Um, if you're non-responsive, we're gonna reject that paper. There's one that came up yesterday that Steve Finn had rejected and, and um, after revision, and the authors wrote back and says, why did you reject it? And Steve said again, you weren't responsive to the comments of my request. So if you're not responsive, you're probably gonna get the paper rejected. Now, sometimes reviews provide conflicting suggestions if the editor in the letter hasn't clarified how to deal with those, it's perfectly appropriate to contact the, the editor and say, this reviewer wanted this kind of analysis, this reviewer wanted a totally different kind of analysis. What do you want? Um, you know, there are different ways of doing these responses. Some people put in a table where in the left-hand column, you might put in the reviewer's comments, the right-hand table, put in your responses. Um, but the important thing is that is this, that long explanations to the editor in the cover letter is not the same as modifying the text. And again, putting in a long argument of why this reviewer is wrong or why you don't think you, sh you should do that, want to do that, um, may end up the paper not being accepted. So there's an art to this. Um, and it's mostly based upon being polite, being thorough, and common sense. So what are journals interested in? Um, they're interested in novelty, things that are new. They will rank among kinds of papers that they accept, um, randomized clinical trials probably at, the, probably at the top because those are the most likely to be cited, and most likely to change clinical practice or policy interested in papers that have an effect upon clinical care or population health. So if there is a rare disease, but you see a very large effect, that may make the bar. If you see a common disease like obesity or smoking, even a 5% decrease in that problem on a public health scale may be enormously important. 
public health emergency. Um, clearly, you know, with the COVID is the prime example of that. Um, and the just to give you an idea of the rapidity at which the literature has expanded with COVID, I had an article submitted to me a couple of weeks ago where they looked at the most cited papers um, for COVID. So the COVID papers primarily didn't appear until January of 2020. And the most cited paper, meaning that had already been cited in a article that was published, was cited 12,000 times. <laughs> 12,000 times in a year. And there were lots of papers that were, sub, that were, were cited more than 1,000 times. Lower priority stuff that's not novel. Now, we do plenty of surveys, but you have to realize that surveys are somewhat less likely to get published than our other kinds of database studies. Data that is older, um, you know, trying to, I mean, we see this fairly commonly. People have done a randomized control trial or some other observation study 10 years ago, and now is they're reporting on it. And you wonder, you ask yourself, well, where has where this data been sitting for the last 10 years? You know, association with that clinical implications. Um, you know, that's hard to know what to do with that. And because it doesn't have any clinical implications or you're not specific about the clinical implications, probably not gonna get it. Qualitative research, um, people do qualitative research. I am members of papers that have done qualitative research. Um, many journals don't publish qualitative research. You need to make sure that the journal you choose does in fact publish qualitative research. Let's go through some common mistakes that people can make. You already mentioned about the abstract um, and numbers, inconsistencies in the paper, um, you know, or, or the, for example, like you might put in, in the method section, we follow people up at 12 weeks, but then in the results section, you present stuff that was eight weeks follow up, or what happens in 12 weeks follow up. I already mentioned very beginning is one have two or three common themes that you're, you're saying. If you have many messages and comparisons, um, you know, that's not going to be successful. I had a paper that, that was an important topic, um, but they had tons of different comparisons in it. I asked them to cut that down. They revised it and it didn't cut them down. So I ended up rejecting that paper. Um, exaggeration of findings. This is a fairly common problem. Um, people, you know, get NIH grant. They spend five years doing a randomized controlled trial. And then they find out that the result was, was so-called negative, that there was no difference between the two groups. I feel like that's still an important topic. If NIH funded it, um, they must have thought that it was an important topic to begin with, realizing that it may, may not end up showing an effect. I think they're important. But if you have a, um, if you have a randomized controlled trial and the primary outcome shows no difference between groups. You need to report it as such and not try to spin it as being positive. Sometimes people don't even put in what the primary outcome was and they focus on some secondary outcome, which was um, significantly different between the two groups. So again, be honest there and don't spin the findings. Is the paper methodologically and statistically clear? Um, you can make your paper incredibly complicated and that may turn off the, the reader and the editor. Um, again, with statistical clarity, don't use word trends or marginal significance. Um, people, first of all, are getting away from using p-values. They want point estimates like means or odds ratios or, or relative risks and 95% confidence intervals. And don't say, you know, somebody puts in, well, the p was 0.09, therefore there was a trend or a marginal significance. It's not significant and just be honest with yourself. So before we get into some of these other issues, are there any questions so far? Uh, no questions in the chat. Okay. Open access, um, Gemini Org Open is an open access journal. And there's a difference between open access and public access. Um, so with open access, you're not only free to read it, but you can use it and modify it without the author's permission. While in public access, you actually have to get the author's permission because the author retains copyright. Um, the oh, public access is, an, is um, 
the, the finances of it are basically um, done through advertising or subscriptions. While in open access, there's an author publishing charge. And um, German Network Open is 3,000 bucks. Delay in public access is usually delayed access behind uh, where the pay, where the paywall is removed, um, and that depends upon the funding agency um, or the publication. It could be six, twelve, or twenty-four months. But open access is immediate access to everybody. Um, public access is required by NIH. Um, they don't require open access. While open access is required by Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust, and some other other organizations. So I personally think that what's going to happen in the future is more open access, but we'll see what happens. Uh, I have some questions now. Yeah. Uh, some authors pay to get their work published. Is that fair? And are rejection rates similar? It depends on the journal. So like the many journals who have an option, um, say like JAMA Pediatrics, you could have an option of, of paying a fee versus not. It, the decision on that though, is not even in the hands of the editor. That's in the hands of, of the administrative people. And so whether or not you chose open access and gonna pay a fee does not affect your decision to get, to get um, published. Now, there are what we call predatory open access journals. There are thousands of open access journals and the predatory journals are like I go ahead and set up a journal. I charge say $500 um, for accepting a paper, but I don't send it out for review. And I pretty much have a 98% acceptance rate. And um, my, audit, my journal is not indexed in PubMed and it's predatory. It's predatory in the authors because they think they're Publish, publishing it in a legitimate journal, but in actually they're, they're just helping this um, predator make money. So there is something called the Directory of Open Access Journals, DOAJ, and you can look and see whether um, these journals that you might be considering are listed in that. I'm sh I get probably five to 10 emails a day uh, from predatory open access journals um, asking me to publish. Okay. Uh, are open access journals seen as less rigorous compared to journals authors do not pay to publish in? Um, no, I think that that's, that's changing. Um, I think that open access journals like our open access journal, um, plus one plus medicine, they're viewed as rigorous journals and have very good impact factors. So, but again, the, the predatory journals are not they're, they're, they're viewed as very inferior publications and people should stay away from those journals. Uh, what should we advise young investigators? Should we ask them to try standard journals and if rejected, then apply to a paid journal? Not necessarily. Um, you know, you like for example, in JAMA Network Open, um, we have many, many papers that come to us preferentially. I, I think that you should, pick the um, journal that you think is gonna give you the audience that you want and then submit it, whether it be an open access journal or a traditional journal. Is it helpful to request a certain co-editor to manage the paper who has expertise in the field or who has previously published important papers on the topic? Are these requests typically, typically granted? Um, I think you can request it, um, you know, if if there is a person that's a associate editor that you you know um, is at a journal and has knowledge about the field, you certainly can request that. And and you know, we do that if that that request comes in. Most of the time, the editor will do that anyhow. You know, um, if a paper is on a particular topic, and I have an associate editor who knows that topic. I'm gonna send that paper to that, that person. Anyhow, I don't think there's any harm in doing it. Um, I don't know that it's necessary though. One of the large arguments against open access is that it may negatively influence the ability of early researcher, researchers to publish in quality journals. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I think you have to remember that um, no one really pays the open access fee out of their pocket. 
So this is a legitimate expense for um, a NIH grant to include an NIH grant. And I think that if you're submitting NIH grants, you certainly should include a certain amount of money in there for open access charges and NIH will view this as legitimate. You um, can ask your co-authors if you're, if you're a, a fellow or a junior faculty member, um, the, to your Mentors, co-authors have access to to departmental funds or other grant funds that they can use to do it. Um, and then, if you are coming from a another country or a poor institution, I think you can ask for a fee waiver. I grant fee waivers. I don't grant a lot. I mean, last year we published um, thirteen hundred articles, and I pr probably granted about half a dozen fee waivers. Yeah, but I think you have to be realistic. When the first fee waiver I ever was asked to for was a pediatric cardiology from Johns Hopkins. So it's hard for me to kind of be sympathetic to that person pleading poverty that they couldn't afford to pay the open access fees. Uh, we have nine minutes left, but there are more questions. Do you want me to read all the questions that came in? Yeah, we can do that. Okay, uh, do promotions committees care where you publish? Yes, they do. I think that promotions committee will look at, I mean, some people will, will calculate your age index. Some people would look at the impact factor of a particular journal. Um, so I think, yes, they do look at where you publish. Okay. Uh, why is the cost too high? It's per, uh, can you please, oh, me, okay. Why is the cost too high? Adam Gato, please, please mute yourself. Adam, please mute yourself. Okay. Uh, why is the cost too high? It's prohibitory for international authors from LMICs. Well, it's not too high. It is high, but it's not too high. Um, and those authors from LMICs can request a fee waiver. Uh, are reviews in the JAMA network double blind? Is there a movement towards double blind reviews and what are your thoughts about it? They're not double blind. Um, I think that the attempt to make the, re the reviews blind is, is futile. It's really hard to go through a paper and redact it. Um, and it's, it has really not been shown to affect the quality of a review. Uh, Dr. Rivara, certain urgent Research reporting is now making more use of preprint servers. Sometimes this is because journals can't find technical reviewers in realistic time. Is there any difference in acceptability or novelty of the work from preprint servers during journal editorial review? So here's a slide I had on preprint servers. Um, there's BioArchive, there's something called MedArchive as well. Um, we have now come around to the fact that if you want to post something on preprint servers, that's fine. And we're not going to um, look on it negatively. I think that you have to realize that that preprint servers are, you know, servers that have papers on it that are not peer reviewed. They are now included in PubMed, though. Um, and there are differences oftentimes in what appears in a preprint server and what actually appears in the journal. So I think it's fine to publish it. You have to ask yourself, what are you gaining by publishing it there? Um, but it's not going to be held against you by the journal. Does it change the reviewer feedback process? No. OK, that was all the questions in the chat. OK, um, let me see here. Go through, I want to go through authorship stuff. So authorship is important. And um, these are the International Committee of Medical Journal Editor requirements. And you have to meet all of these requirements to um, be eligible as an author. And this is something that you ought to decide ahead of time when you're first drafting the paper, um, before you start drafting the paper, who's gonna be co-authors on it and what's gonna be the order of the authorship. Um, usually the person who does the most work and writes up the paper gets to be first author. Um, but you want to stay away from gift authorship where like the head of the lab, just because they're old and well-known um, are on a paper without contributing anything to the work of it. Um, so that's a, something to be talked about 
um, early on. Um, duplicate publication, I think, is an important topic. Now, you might have a data set that you know you use and you publish a ton of articles on, and that's fine. But you don't want to um, do what we call salami science. So you don't want to publish an article, say, on males of one publication and then turn around two weeks later and submit an article, sort of a similar article on females, which goes through the exact same stuff. Those are not duplicate publications, but they're pretty, pretty darn close. And that's what we call salami science, where you're trying to um, get as many articles as possible out of a data set where they really should be contained in one, one article. Um, spin and boasting. I think you have to be careful with this. Um, you know, there's the E.B. White has a famous saying, write with nouns and verbs, not adjectives and adverbs. Um, you, things like alarming, drastic, dramatic, they don't belong, those words don't belong in a scientific publication. Also be very clear, be very careful about saying like in your discussion, this article is the largest, this article is the first, this article is the most X, Y, Z. Um, you know, that's boasting that frankly may not be true. Um, and so I'd be very careful about using those kinds of words. Um, and this is the last slide here. And I wanna just emphasize this, writing is a learned skill. When I first started out, I was a crappy writer. My wife made fun of me. And I think it's really something you can learn. You can learn to do well. Um, collaborate with others. It's more fun. Your research is going to be better. Um, there's nearly always a journal out there that will publish your work. Rejection does not mean it's a poor paper most of the time. So that's it. Any other questions? Let's take down the slides here. Stop slide sharing. Let's see here. We have three minutes left. Any other questions? I have a question, Fred. I just yeah. had, I was, I was getting uh, rushed trying to type it out. I didn't want it to be over. Um, what do you have, what do you have in terms of advice in terms of productive writing to getting stuff out and just in regards to you know, developing writing schedules or habits that you can have to be a productive writer as opposed to just you know sort of the techniques to being a quality writer? I, I think that what you want to do is work in blocks of time. I think that um, you should um, set aside a block of three or four hours to work on something. If you work on an hour and then have to switch and do something else, it's really hard to kind of get in the groove of, of it. I think you're going to be most most um, effective if you can say black out a, a block of time. I mean, when I was younger and and, and um, had other stuff going on, I would oftentimes come in on a Saturday morning, work for you know, a, a morning, and use that to really get a lot of work done on a, on a paper. But I would sort of block out some time, turn off your internet or your email rather, um, and close the door put up a sign, right, Katie, and say, I'm writing, don't bother me. Katie, what else did I say in terms of that? Say no, particularly the projects that won't be valuable or lead to productive outcomes. Other questions? All right. Well, thanks very much for listening. Uh, if you have any other questions, just feel free to email. My email is f is and Fred, p is and Peter, r at uw.edu. Thanks. It looks like there's a feedback there survey. Take care. <laughs>